Not a sponsor in sight, although a donation of homemade raspberry jam from a friend in Aviemore was accepted. A 25,000 mile voyage with a tight budget and an aging second hand icebreaker. Why do it? The Aviemore seafarer and publisher at the helm hit 50 last year. As a seafarer, I suppose in the first half of my career, one challenge that I never did was go around Cape Horn. And it, you know, I started to look at it and thought, okay, well, what about if I took my own boat and went round Cape Horn in my 50th birthday year? And when I started to look at the Southern Oceans, I realized that a complete circumnavigation of all of the capes in the Southern Hemisphere had never ever been completed on a motorboat less than 24 meters. Down, what we found out is we encountered uh, southeast trade winds and the resulting currents uh, for more than uh, 2,000 miles, uh, which has resulted in arriving into St Helena four days later than what we'd actually expected. This information is so critical because the conditions we've had on this front are not going to be dissimilar to what we would have uh, from here down to South Africa, from South Africa to Mauritius to an extent across to Australia, and of course the big one on the Pacific. This has had a big impact on thinking, and for the last 10 days, uh, we've been busy reworking the whole route. The weather router's been uh, working at it with us as well, and uh, we're looking at a fundamental change. Uh, after St. Helena, uh, we're gonna turn west and head to South America. Uh, basically, we're going to refuel at uh, a reverse of the existing stops we were looking at. Uh, after St Helena, next stop will be uh, Montevideo, uh, from Montevideo uh, to Ushuaia. Then uh, we'll go round to Valparaiso in the west of Chile, uh, across the Pacific to Tahiti, uh, down to New Zealand. Uh, we'll go to uh, southwest Australia, uh, across to Mauritius, down to Durban. And we will come back into St Helena. Uh, now on our way home in uh, early to mid May 2022. In terms of timings, we think this actually will now start to uh, improve with some of the timings. It will pick up the uh, hours that we've lost, the days we've lost on this leg, and we'll pick up some time on some of the longer legs, whereas uh, otherwise we were going to lose time uh, if we continue to head eastward. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, that's us out of St. Helena. Big thanks to everyone that sent in uh, uh, all the messages uh, today. Uh, I think my favorite would have to be from the Marine Manager at Andrew Weir Shipping, who, who said, had we done a change like this uh, back in the old days, the real upset it would have given to the mail room would have been uh, quite incredible. So we're up, we're underway. Uh, we've left St. Helena, we're westward bound. Uh, we're, now, uh, we're now chasing the, uh, the setting sun. And uh, yeah, looking very much forward to uh, the next 16, 17 days at sea and getting into Montevideo. All in this boat, what, which are the characteristics of this boat? Astra was built as uh, an ice class boat here. If you lift this, and this is, this is the hull. So she was built as an ice breaking boat, so she really is. She's super strong and she is almost as strong now as she was when she was built. We now made a very, very fast speed across to Uruguay. We were now starting to claw back those six days that we had lost on that initial leg to St. Helena. I was on watch and everything was set up, calmed down. And suddenly I have a big vibration, uh, you know, the, the whole boat. 
So straight away I, do, I, I call Ian. So what's going on? So we rip off the we rip off the engine and expect to think that we have a big massive rope shuffle to the propeller. Okay. And Paul, uh, you went down the engine room. Uh, what did you see down there? What were the checks? Well, the first thing we checked was the uh, get me home coupling to make sure that it hadn't uh, come loose and started um, contacting the hole. We also checked the shaft generator um, arrangements as well to make sure that something hadn't come loose there. Well, we're still trying to decide what it happened, and then um, we need to go check the header tank on the stern tube. And um, previously, I'd just done the log a couple of hours, hours beforehand, and we'd lost 15 liters of oil in the header tank. So here we are, 400 miles from Cape Horn. Currently skimming along at nine knots. I mean, here we are, we're, we're, we're just coming around uh, uh, Cabo San Diego, heading down to uh, Cabo de Hornos. Uh, we're getting in some current at the moment. Uh, are the stabilizers uh, in or out? No, out. <laughs> no, out. <laughs> Coming up in Cape Horn, Cape Horn off in the distance. miles west-northwest of Cape Horn. A weather front coming in from the west. And we're making our way on a course of 300 at a speed of six knots. What you have is the confluence of two great oceans. So if you take Cape Horn, for example, you have the South Atlantic Ocean is now colliding with the South Pacific Ocean. And you've got the Antarctica all mixing up into this, where you've got you know super cold storms, where it's incredibly confused uh, sea conditions. They're coming at you from, from every direction. Uh, and on top of that, you've got howling winds where the wind chill factor is, uh, is well below sub-zero. Clouds up for the Tonga earthquake. We really are uh, completely on our own, and for a big extent of that uh, Pacific crossing, uh, the closest company we had was the International Space Station that flew over us at 220 miles. Uh, for 3,000 miles, that was the closest uh, human contact that we had. The first one was uh, in the Pacific when we were going from Tahiti and we were going to New Zealand and New Zealand closed the border with COVID and they said no you cannot come and then a, a tropical cyclone came into the Pacific and we then had to turn and go back to Tahiti. visibility down to 100 meters, 300 miles east of 
Wellington with a low pressure of just about 100 miles astern of us. The Tasman Sea is the area uh, between New Zealand and, and Tasmania, the, the southeast corner of Australia. It's affectionately known as the ditch, but from a sailor's point of view, the Tasman is viewed as one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world. But we had a, a 1,000 mile crossing. Uh, it was going to take us about five days. You, you know, we, we already had to do 2,600 miles to get here. So, you know, we're computing our fuel. Uh, we're not running on empty, but, you know, we're down to about a third of a tank. So we're having to be careful. You're driving the vessel, being considerate. But I also understood that, you, you know, the Tasman has a reputation of being ugly and I might need more power to punch through. We had three days where we were yo-yoing in seas that were uh, seven meters in height. But what you had was the wavelength came together very, very tight. So you're just up and straight down. And we had two occurrences in the middle day where we got struck by two waves that were about 10 to 12 meters in height. One struck us on the left-hand side, the port side, and the other one on the, the starboard side. And even though we were running with all our stabilizer equipment, trying to keep us as upright as possible. When this wave hit us, we just came to an abrupt halt. So that meant the vessel stopped, but ourselves and everything that wasn't bolted down got moved straight across the vessel and almost threw one lad, Dan, out of his bunk. That was incredible. But, you know, all the crew afterwards spoke about it and, you know, they said, you know, not at any point did I actually feel terrified or that we were going to lose our life or, or this was it or whatever, because they had confidence in the vessel. But we had, we just had to ride it out and it was exhausting. You know, we, we had crew for three days who never got sleep for more than about 30 or 40 minutes before they finally got woken awake. Uh, so it really was quite incredible crossing the Tasman Sea. What is my cake? Watch with it, storm away. Storm away. <laughs> so here we are approaching the fourth Cape, Cape Leo Wind on Southwest Australia. It's Friday the 1st of April, 0600. We've got a force 6 to 7 blowing all night, seas of 4.5 metres. We're only now starting to get just a little bit of shelter off the land and it's now safe to come out on deck just to capture some footage. Here we are in the Indian Ocean, 2,000 miles from Mauritius. Friday, 8th April. The fanzine here, not the viewer? Not really. <laughs> not at all. What are you doing for us today, Mikey? Me, uh, Carnation chicken. Yes. And is it an Emmerdale theme for uh, tea tonight? What's that? Emmerdale for tea tonight. Angus. Angus balls, some crayfish. For start. <laughs> Managed three of the capes that we've had uh, South End in New Zealand, uh, South East Cape, Tasmania, and Cape Lewin, South West Australia. Disappointed to miss out in Cape of Good Hope? Yes. That's all. I think that's everybody's uh, okay. They want to do at some point. So first of all, Pete, you're one of the few people uh, that actually saw Astor before all the conversion work for the circumnavigation. You joined us in Fremantle last week. Uh, how did she look on uh, coming back to it? Uh, quite a transformation in. Uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, both uh, externally and internally. So uh, um, the outside's all been painted. Uh, and despite having travelled 23,000 miles by the time you reach Fremantle, still looked in uh, great shape. Um, and then internally, uh, there's a whole series of new systems here on the bridge in particular that weren't here before. Uh, so I have a new radar system, the wave analyzer wasn't there previously, uh, the, uh, charting system I think was new as well, the engine management system uh, on the trip up from Gibraltar to Lanzarote we were running up and down from the bridge to the engine room every hour uh, trying to record the, um, the engine parameters uh, whereas now they're always delivered uh, at 
be on. So yeah, concentrate on this. You've obviously put in a lot of work over those months, um, getting it all ready. No, she remains very comfortable in the sea. Um, we've got waves at the moment of between two and three metres. Uh, we have actually got the stabilizers on today, um, which uh, does keep the, uh, the roll off the boat. But no, very, si very similar to um, how I've done with it before. Uh, except, I think, one difference, the catering's better this time. <laughs> the boys have got that completely made. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say as well, you know, you've joined uh, four and a half months into a circumnavigation on, well, the smallest vessel to ever do it via the Southern Capes. Uh, but I think it's very fair to say that everyone was incredibly high spirits in the, by the time you joined in that, considering the length of time they've all been on board, which is quite stunning. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the, uh, the morale on board, the accident on board is really good. It's, uh, it's a small team, uh, you plus four others, uh, and your three regular crew members have uh, been very welcoming to me. Um, I do suffer a significant disadvantage on board, and I'm not from Scotland, but um, maybe my Celtic origins being Cornish has somehow softened that blow. It's Sunday 24 April. And we're just passing Port Elizabeth, South Africa. We've got a wind of about 23, 24 knots on the nose. The seas at three and a half meters. And this is what's viewed as a fairly good rounding of South Africa. Dan is doing his love book. <laughs> route from the Canary Islands would take us down through West Africa. Now, when we passed the coasts of uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia, we kept 200 to 280 miles off the coast for a period of five days southbound and three days northbound. We actually completely blacked out. Uh, we switched off our satellite transponder, so all the friends and family that were watching us, and you know, we we had a lot of friends who were on a dedicated app who could see us 24 hours a day. That was now suddenly removed. All of our navigation lights were off. All our portholes were blacked out. Uh, we had no lighting other than some very low-level strip lighting that was on board. We're keeping a piracy watch. We've got extra radars running, and we've got extra provisions such as uh, night vision binoculars, etc all on board and then there's even things like fitness you know we've come back with no strength in our in our leg muscles the the, the boat has 28 steps on it to the bottom of the engine room to the top of the bridge that's it but it's going to be great to see uh, to see family and you know there's going to be more than a few tears then uh, i'm absolutely sure um but the main thing is uh, is relaxing. There's no there's no great designs on uh, on having a few beers or whatever because we have we've had almost nothing in in six months. So uh, you know one sniff and we're all going to fall over. So we have to be very very careful of that. 
And you look, we've been 151 days at sea, 31 and a half thousand miles, uh, five crew. And, you know, the, the driver is to get the boat and get all the crew home safely. Getting to step ashore into the arms of your family, you've got a crowd cheering you on and you've got a very large round of applause. You know, it's all incredibly uh, emotional. For the first time in 165 days, you can actually let your guard down and you look at it and you know you've done it. You know you've completed a world first here, but importantly, you know that you got the crew and the boat all back in one piece. And at that point, it really is enormous.